Einen wunderschönen guten Abend wünsche ich Ihnen, wo immer Sie auch sein mögen. Herzlich willkommen. Ich freue mich, dass Sie da sind. Und nein, nicht wegschalten, bitte. Sie sind tatsächlich bei einer Veranstaltung der Hamburger Stiftung für politisch Verfolgte und des Literaturzentrums Hamburg gelandet, auch wenn die Kulisse anderes zu versprechen scheint. Ich bin Johannes von Dunani, Journalist, Autor und heute Abend im Gespräch mit dem ukrainischen Journalisten Alexei Bobrovnikov, der seit einigen Jahren hier in Deutschland lebt. In Grauzonen geht es um die Ukraine und die Wirren des Landes seit seiner Unabhängigkeit vor bald 30 Jahren. Es geht um den Journalisten Bobrovnikov, der so lange über die Hintergründe der Ermordung seiner Informanten recherchiert, bis er aus Angst um das eigene Leben die Heimat verlassen musste. Und schließlich geht es auch um Moby Dick, den Seefahrerroman von Herman Melville. Warum das so ist, seien Sie einfach gespannt. Und in all dem wollen wir erklären und beschreiben und hören, wie Menschen wie Alexei Bobrovnikov das Exil erleben oder auch erleiden. Alexei, I introduced you as a journalist from Ukraine. But in reality, at least part of your family hails from St. Petersburg in Russia. This is a long story which somehow follows your family for the last hundred years and not only positively. Yeah, that's so true. That's so true. Part of the family died in Skopje, contemporary, you know, more no northern Macedonia. They were killed by Tito regime. So this was my grand-grandfather on mother's side. And uh, the, one of the relatives of my father was this, uh, it was called the comrade of the, um, the, the, the educational, whatever, minister authority back in St. Petersburg. So it was a mixed family from, uh, from Kiev, Ukraine, from St. Petersburg, uh, part of which later fled to Macedonia. And uh, this is how they split them exactly 100 years ago. Yeah. Still, it must be difficult for you, raised in a Russian-speaking environment in Ukraine, to find your own cultural identity. That's a good one, Johannes. Uh, I think I was born Russian and raised Ukrainian. Uh, when, the, uh, when the monster collapsed, the Soviet Union collapsed, I, my granny, she was uh, Ukrainian. She was half Polish and half Ukrainian. That's my Ukrainian side. And she was reading poetry to me when I was a kid. And I, I, I grew up listening to, to the music of this language, which, which was beautiful. And so I realized that Ukrainian is a separate identity. And the language is, is something that resembles Italian or Spanish. It's absolutely made for singing and making love. Um, I was still too young to make love, but I was okay to listen to poetry. I was 12 at a time, and uh, it was beautiful. And then I started, I started learning Ukrainian uh, after the collapse of the But what do you Indian. feel today? Are you more Russian or Ukrainian? I am uh, a journalist, which is some, uh, you know, sometimes it's a state-less, uh, sex-less, uh, um, bodyless uh, entity that is uh, basically hunting for information like a whale hunts for squids. Okay, we will come to the whale and the squids and ships afterwards. Uh, but let's talk Ukraine. For but I'm Ukrainian, so to, 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 to be precise. Yes, I'm Ukrainian. Very good. Uh, from a European perspective, The Ukraine has been a troubled state ever since independence 30 years ago. We had corrupt governments, we had failed revolutions, we had the annexation of the Krim, of the Crimea, we had problems with Eastern, or we still have them, problems in Eastern Ukraine. To my mind comes Hamlet. Uh, you know the station, uh, Though this be madness, yet there is method in it. There is indeed. 
asking you, are we talking madness? Are we talking method? Or maybe both together? That was this good one with uh, Coppola's Apocalypse when uh, the, this character who comes to kill the coronal courts uh, said, you know, the, the head of staff said that your methods became unsound. Uh, courts asks him back, do you see any methods? Uh, wh wh what do you see? And he says, I don't see any methods, sir. That's a good one, but that's a fiction. And in the reality, there is a method. And this method is uh, bizarre, obscure, uh, it may look crazy, but this is a method that the, the big eye snake of, uh, of the former KGB that has turned into dozens and dozens smaller secret services and intelligence agencies all around this post-Soviet empire is kind of gaining back the force, the influence and the money. So those uh, uh, monster with uh, dozens of heads is fighting uh, for the superiority. And how does the journalist Alexey Bobrovnikov fit into this picture? I tried to not to make the story forgotten and to, re to, to make Europeans feel that this is not a safe heaven in Europe, that you can escape from the madness just that happens just around the corner. So I've realized that I have to write a story that would make Europeans feel insecure, because this is important to feel insecure, because in security there is the biggest threat. So you're talking about your book Grey Zones, about which we'll talk in, in, in a couple of minutes. Let me first take you back to Maidan, uh, the central square of Kiev, which gave its name to the so far last revolution, pro-democracy. Plus couple of revolutions indeed. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And here are you, and we have the picture, and we show it now. Here you come armed with a megaphone. Uh, you're reading a poem. You're reading Joseph Brodsky to a line of special forces. What were you up to? I brought them books. I was bringing them books constantly. I was bringing them books to the, to the front line. I was bringing them to the lines of the police. I, I think reading is a good thing for a cop, whether he's a good cop or a bad cop. But, you know, reading distracts him from his main eye occupation, you know, being a cop in the post-Soviet world. So uh, for the cops uh, on Maidan, I was bringing the, the books from my uh, uh, library when I was a kid. Basically, I took them from my granny's apartment to bring it to them. So these were not uh, some serious things uh, as we look at them uh, as an adults as, and professionals. These were things you bring for kids, because those people in front of me, they were basically kids, 18, 19 year old boys. So I brought them some Jules Verne and some, uh, and some, uh, some mind read and you know, some, some very basic childish uh, you know, pulp fiction that you want people to, um, to kind of, you want to introduce them to some, some reading. So this is what I did. But also I thought of reading the Brodsky, which is a great thing to, to read to anyone who wears the uniform. Because this letter to General Zed is something that shows the paradox, the craziness and the, the absolute nonsense of, uh, of wearing a uniform uh, in the situation when you can receive an order which would be corrupt. Uh, Therefore, you put yourself in a position to become a victim of someone's craziness following the order that is unsound indeed. It's time for a little reading. And uh, let me introduce your Grey Zone book. It's February 2015. Uh, and let me introduce also one of the main characters of your book. Uh, Andrei Galushenko. 
Uh, Galushenko has served in the Ukrainian army. He has offered his services as a volunteer to the domestic intelligence service, the FSU. And he is sent to Debalcheve to investigate uh, rumors that there is looting and there is violence against the uh, Ukrainian population. And he goes and then he gets arrested. And that's the moment we enter your book. In fact, he was sent there to escort the children being evacuated from the place. And this, you know, investigative activity was coming along, which was crazy because he was never following any orders. He was just uh, trying to uh, um, to stop the looting, which was which has occurred apparently in a situation when, when he was executing some some okay. other order. Okay. The, the the craziness of the guy and craziness of everyone who follows its own instincts in times of war is exactly what you said. So, and you, you write, I read it in German, Nein, Andrei Galushenko wurde in diesem Februar nicht von feindlichen Truppen gefangen genommen, obwohl so etwas in jenen Tagen mehr als üblich und angesichts der Intensität, mit der die Russen den Ring um die Stadt festgezogen hatten, sehr wahrscheinlich gewesen wäre. Es waren seine eigenen Leute. Die Plünderer gehörten einem in Debalzewe stationierten ukrainischen Polizeibataillon an, das nach leichter Beute suchte. Solche Leute gab es reichlich, sowohl unter den Besatzungsmächten, den Separatisten, den waffentragenden Russen, als auch unter den Ukrainern selbst. An diesem Tag im Februar also wurde Andrei in Debalzewe festgenommen. Man wollte ihn der Spionage zugunsten des Feindes und der Sabotage beschuldigen. Die Tatsache, dass diejenigen, die ihn ergriffen hatten, Plünderer waren, schien niemanden zu interessieren und war genauso wenig wie die Tatsache zu beweisen, dass Andrei Galuschenko bewaffnet, aber in Zivil aus angeblich humanitären Gründen nach Debalze gekommen war. Sie führten Galuschenko also hinaus in den Schnee und ließen ihn dort stehen, während Granaten durch eine Nachbarstraße flogen. Es war russisches Roulette in seiner märchenhaftesten, wahrhaft epischen Form. Achtmal in dieser Nacht wurde Andrei in den Schnee hinausgeführt und stehen gelassen, bis der Beschuss nachließ. Und am nächsten Tag wurde er dann unter dem Druck des Hauptquartiers und mehrerer seiner Freunde unter Freiwilligen und Aktivisten in die Freiheit entlassen. Nein, er war nicht dazu verurteilt gewesen, in dieser Nacht im Beschuss russischer Artillerie zu sterben. In diesem russischen Roulette, das die von ihm der Plünderung überführten Kämpfer im Scherz erdacht hatten, blieb ihm das Glück treu. Andrei Galuschenko sollte sieben Monate später auf ganz andere Art und Weise sterben. Einigen von uns ist es offenbar in die Wiege gelegt, dafür zu sterben, dass wir unsere Nase immer in fremde Angelegenheiten stecken müssen. Are you sticking your nose always in other people's affair? Ja, yeah, with um, more than a dozen Um, security services and intelligence agencies in my country, it almost, uh, it's almost impossible not to stick your nose into someone's business. So that's exactly what I was doing and still do. But in your book, you describe life in a hot zone of a hybrid war. I would agree, these experiences are absolutely true. There are no safe places and No certainties about loyalty, about friendship, about trust. How did you come to know Andrei Galushenko and why did you trust him? I was looking for a source to dig into um, the smuggling and the, the money laundering of war. And I was a business reporter in my past. I, I was a white collar dude who was, uh, who was doing mergers and acquisitions, especially unfriendly style. 
which was a uh, name of the game in that part of the world, everywhere. But there, in the wild 90s and later in the beginning of the millennia when the Russian money was flowing into the country and everyone was buying everything that was, uh, that was possible to buy. If it's not possible to buy, you kind of steal it. So this is what these guys do and so this is what I was doing covering those type of, of very interesting business activities. And it appeared to me the war uh, in its hybrid stage was that type of affair just with the new figures, new Don Corleone's of this particular um, mergers and acquisition business. But then you understand at a certain point it is different. There is something else happening. Exactly. Uh, the combination of the military operation plus the, the money laundering and smuggling, which is something that involves both parties of the conflict and all of the players on this black market needed, I, I needed a few reliable sources who were really deep into that shit. And one of them was Andre, of whom I've heard from a couple of people who were holding posts and positions in the Poroshenko's administration, who were seemingly, um, at that point they were seemingly independent but they were using the, the volunteers and the true um, fighters of that war, those people who are called patriots in this part of the, in every war, mm -hmm. uh, they were using them to, to, to take over the um, financial and, uh, operations and smuggling and to put it under the control of the main security service, the um, SBU, the one that is the, the daughter or the, the youngest son and, and of Andrew, the KGB. And Andre is helping you, he's providing information, he confirms your suspicions, he is a source, an informant. Exactly. So he started sharing his stuff with me after the, the few days we started working together on the front line. We um, established a, a, a pretty good relationship which clearly led to the new exposures of the uh, malicious dealings on the front line. And then something terrible happens. Early, late August, early September 2015, Something terrible really happens. I hate when my, my sources are killed. It never happened before. Um, I was warned not to stick my nose into the military brigade business a few days before he was murdered. But you never take threats seriously when you're on the front line, unless there's shelling happening right here in the spot. You don't bullshit me with threats, I don't care. So I kind of ignored this warning. This was the first warning that came from the relatives of the commander of the military brigade that was in charge in the sector. And then two days later, and four days before we plan to resume the work. So we started working with Andre, and then I went on investigating the other locations on the front line. I received the first warning, then the second warning was really mortal. That was the, the message that I received on the cell phone saying that my boys are in trouble, my boys meaning my sources. And I've realized in a few minutes that Andre and the other guy who was riding in the same car we both were using on the front line, they were both murdered uh, in a series of uh, blasts of the anti-personnel mines, directed blasts. It was a premeditated murder and the place where it happened still could be used by the enemy side, theoretically. However, the previous attempt on his group that just happened hours before we started working together, maybe as a warning sign, we still don't know that, but the place of the first attempt, it left no doubt who did it, because so the first it? attempt happened exactly in the vicinity and the proximity of the 
s s most secure location in the whole sector, which was the, the headquarters okay. of the brigade. And so it's September 4, 2015? Uh, September the 2nd, when the murders when when the the murder, murder happened. Yes, but September 4, uh, 2015, when you're back at the front line, you've, done, you've been informed that your sources have been killed. Uh, quite rightly, you say you don't like it when your sources get killed. Uh, and instinctively, you know that this was no coincidence. And on September 4, you're talking to someone who apparently is in the loop on what happened there. Now, we are reading a second part of your book. You start, please, in Russian. Yeah, I got a piece and here. I oh, will here. translate the thing into German. I've prepared it. I don't speak Russian. Good. Yeah, that's 4th of September 2015. Two days after the first murder and uh, hours after the second one, because we're talking about series of murders. I arrive in the town of called Happiness. Uh, the name of the town is Shastya. It's Happiness in uh, in uh, in English. Or a Glücksburg. Auf Deutsch. Kontrabanda это круче любой армии. Продолжал мой информатор. Вдруг в какой-то момент он перестал говорить от третьего лица, говоря уже от себя или группы людей. Я вздрогнул, почувствовав перемену. В какой-то момент я пропустил этот момент. Мой информатор из числа офицеров второй бригады перешел к Шмугл ist cooler als jede Armee, fuhr mein Informant fort. Plötzlich hörte er unerwartet auf, über die anderen zu sprechen, sondern redete von sich selbst oder einer Gruppe von Menschen. Ich zuckte zusammen, als ich die Veränderung bemerkte. Irgendwann, und ich passt, verpasste diesen Moment, hörte mein Informant auf, ein Informant zu sein. In seiner Rede über Schmuggler, die sich nicht aus der dritten, sondern aus der ersten Person an mich richtete, lag eine gewisse Bedrohung. Die Stimme meines Gesprächspartners war dieselbe. Verändert hatten sich nur die Pronomen, die seine eigene Beteiligung andeuteten. Der Schmuggel kann nicht gestoppt werden. Der Schmuggel wird alle zermalmen, der Krieg wird real werden. Nicht so wie diese Scheiße jetzt gerade. In den Häusern, in den Wohnungen wird es einen Guerillakrieg geben, wenn ihr den Schmugglern den Krieg erklärt. Aber dazu kommt es ja nicht zu einem Krieg. Der Schmuggel aber kann nicht gestoppt werden. Das sagte mir ein Offizier der Streitkräfte. Instinktiv überprüfte ich das Mikrofon, das ich vor fremden Blicken versteckt hatte und schrieb weiter mit. Das Mikrofon war da und arbeitete. Das geht nach und nach. Erst das, dann das. Falls notwendig wird, wer aus dem Fenster geworfen, je nachdem, jemanden zu beseitigen, ist eigentlich überhaupt kein Problem. Das sage ich dir als Soldat. Ein Schuss und keiner hört ihn. Ein Klicken am Tag und niemand hört das Klicken des Verschlusses. Der Mann fällt um, woher die Kugel kam, von dort. Später, viel später, würde ich dieses Gespräch anhören und analysieren es mit anderen ähnlichen Dialogen vergleichen. In dem Moment jedoch sah ich meinen Gesprächspartner nur benommen an. Ein Klicken am Tag und niemand hört das Klicken des Verschlusses. Der Mann fällt um, woher die Kugel kam. Von dort, hatte er gesagt, und dorthin gezeigt, wo Separatisten das Gebiet kontrollierten. Aus diesem Gespräch verstand ich eines. Die Brigade hatte jemanden aus den eigenen Reihen im Verdacht und bereitete sich darauf vor, mit den Mördern abzurechnen, schloss jedoch externe Eingriffe nicht völlig aus. Aber dieser Mann, der jetzt vor mir stand, wusste viel mehr, als er sagte. Die Geschwindigkeit, mit der wir den Sektor an diesem Tag verließen, war die beste Vorsichtsmaßnahme, die ich treffen konnte. Vidya, Gib Gas, rief ich dem Fahrer zu. Kaum war mein Informant, der ja nicht ahnte, dass ich seine Aussagen aufgezeichnet hatte, aus dem Blickfeld verschwunden. Und mein Fahrer erfüllte diesmal meine Bitte sofort und ohne Widerrede. 
Nachdem wir in den offenen Gebieten Gas gegeben hatten, kamen wir auf das Allerheiligste zugeflogen, das Hauptquartier der 92. selbstständigen mechanisierten Brigade. Hinter uns, nur 300 Meter auf der Straße entfernt, war die Stelle, wo Mitglieder der Anti-Schmuggel-Einheit die Stelle nach Patronenhülsen absuchten, wo der namenlose Schütze des ersten Attentats gelegen hatte. Nie würde ein Saboteur von der feindlichen Seite die Patronenhülsen aufsammeln, weil er Angst haben müsste, identifiziert zu werden. Aber genau so hatte es sich einige Tage zuvor hier abgespielt. Nur das zerdrückte Gras und die von den Freiwilligen bestimmte Flugbahn der Kugel, die auf diesen Ort verwiesen, zeigten die Stelle an, von dem aus geschossen wurde. Keine erkennbare Spur, keine Zigarettenkippe, keine Patronenhülse. That's it. That was the second warning, I would say. Yes. Okay. You're fleeing a crime scene. You're going back to Kiev. Uh, you understand that the story has changed. You start to dig into the murder of Galushenko, Typhoon, and other people. Did you really think that at that time somebody was actively planning to kill you? I was told so by the, uh, the deputy head of Ukrainian prosecutor's office. Um, I was told openly that I'm the next target. Um, it may have been a, an attempt to threaten me. It may have been the factual part. Um, they never knew how much I know. I knew a bit more than I was showing openly. And I was still wearing a poker face dealing with the people on the scene because I was coming back to the crime scene again and again to meet the suspects. But they would never kill me before they knew how much I know. And I was still playing friendship with them. It's the only way you could still get the information out of them. And I was collecting it bit by bit for months, pretending to be loyal to the uh, military insignia. And these people in the fields were nominally were my brothers in arms. Because I'm not with the KGB, I'm not with the security service, I'm not with the police, I'm not a cop. I'm not a rat, as the criminals call cops. And for them, Galushenko was a rat, openly being a part of the security service. But who do you think were the masterminds behind the scenes who tried to eliminate you or make you silent? Who are the masterminds? It's a very big business. There's gold smuggling. Andrew witnessed that. Later, when I recovered files from his personal computer that were destroyed by someone, and I still do not, sh I'm not sure, I'm not in a position to, uh, to really tell whether it was the police headquarters or the SBU who destroyed the files on the computer of my source. But we recovered it with a friend of mine from Denmark and with also with a couple of hackers from Ukraine. We recovered the gold and silver stuff uh, that was smuggled on the front line. This is one part of this business. Drug trafficking allegedly was the reason they killed him. Although the amount of those deals, including weapon leakages from the military bases, Gold and silver, uh, scrap metals, and the, the actual products of the precious metals smuggled through the porous borderline, the, the, the demarcation line. Drug trafficking indeed. And murders that were covered up by the other various regiments. This is the system of motives that could I put everyone through this mid-grinder. 
And this is exactly what happened. So what, what exact motive was behind the attempts of silencing me and killing this guy is still remains a mystery. However, I went as far as I could to collect all the threads and pull and them. You, and you knew, of course, that you had something like a journalistic scoop at hand. Uh, it should have made evening primetime news in Ukraine. Uh, your employer, the biggest or one of the biggest TV stations in Ukraine, obviously gave you protection and safety and uh, supported you. That is very true. In case of my murder, the scandal would be much more loud than the case of the assassination of a, of a cop. A killing a celebrity and killing an investigator is a bit different. I was still in my both hats then. It gave me some protection. Uh, that's, that's so. That is so. But this ended at a certain point. First, I was told not to dig into the police, uh, into the dealings of police. Uh, the owner of the TV company I used to work for uh, was and still is pretty close to the Minister of Interior Affairs, which in my uh, part of the world means the police chief. Uh, so that was the first thing. However, the police was not behind the murder. And this evidence that was gathered through the Andrews computer and different other sources was a supplementary material to the whole picture of gray zone, which I used in a book, but which was not a one of the motives, but not the mo most important motive behind the series of crimes. So I kind of ignored this warning first. Then a few weeks later, I was told directly by my supervisor in the media, the head of the news of the TSN, the television news network, and the One Plus One media, I was told by this guy to hold my horses in the investigation. And I, to keep my mouth shut for a little while. I said, okay, no, no worries, I can keep my mouth shut for a few months. With the uh, story, the, the story that would finalize the series of stories that I already uh, aired, I could wait for a few weeks or months before I air this story and keep on gathering the information. But this never happened. And this is what I told him. And then he says, can you stop gathering information? And I said, no, this is what I cannot do. Weeks later, they asked me to sign the resignation letter. It happened after I publicly opposed the, uh, uh, the decoration of the officers by a non-existing Medal of Honor or Medal of Trust that was basically made up to whitewash the reputation by the group of reporters, which is an obscure situation in itself. However, with my hands that were already, um, I was already stopped from doing my, my main job, which was finishing this investigation. This whitewashing of the reputation of suspects was something that clearly led to a situation where the criminals would walk free and the, the, the reputation would remain unspotted. And this is where I could not let them uh, so go. you signed this? So I, I, I opposed that publicly and then they, they, the, the, the management of the media forced me to sign the resignation letter. I signed it on one condition. They give me uh, all the footage that I was able to film in the fields in this case. So in a nutshell, parts of the military and the intelligence services are after you. Your employer has fired you. The prosecutor's office won't assist you, won't help you, won't protect you. How does that feel? It feels like... It feels like... You gotta grab a gun and run and lie low. I had two guns, legal, in my possession. 
legal firearms I was able to, uh, to, to, to have uh, legally in my country. I grabbed them, I lied low for a while, uh, sending SOS signals to the Western media, particularly to DC and to London and also to Brussels, uh, with an attempt to share the story and to do it as fast as possible, just as quick as possible. It feels like, like you cannot, you cannot sleep with your woman unless you feel that the gun is under the, the bed. So you kind of lose your grip of the normal reality. You feel betrayed too? You feel like there's just one thing left to do, to make it public. And that's what I was trying to do. Okay, so it is December 9, 2016. You have talked to or tried to talk to people in the Ukraine. You've asked for assistance internationally. There is only one organization which has responded. It's the Hamburger Stiftung für politisch Verfolgte. And on this evening, December 9, you're doing the decisive step. You're leaving the country. Do you recall your last hours in Kiev? Yeah, I do. I, I dropped by my, my granny's apartment. Um, I was in my, my family place for the last time. I hugged her goodbye. I realized that I was planning to come back as soon as the, the mist you know, would clear. Uh, but I realized that it would probably take a couple of years. and. Uh, she was already old, so I just had to kind of, you know, say goodbye and reassure her that uh, there are people who would still help her when I'm away. Um, I sat in a cab and the cabman recognized me. That was fun because uh, it was, I mean, I was known in town. I'm still known in town, but uh, it's not that I'm the, you know, Larry King of, the, of, of Kiev, no. So I'm known, but I'm not a you know, top celebrity there. So I could be recognized on the streets sometimes, but it was not happening every day. And the last cabman I used in, uh, in Kiev looked at me when I took my seat in a cab and he said, oh, you're this guy who was doing this investigation of Andrew Galushenko case, the case that was known because of my interference in that case. And I already left the gun because I realized that I don't want to arrive in Hamburg with a gun that would turn illegal immediately after I crossed the Ukrainian well border. Thank you. So I left, I left my firearms in the safe and uh, I, I, this was for the first time when I was basically uh, deprived of any kind of even symbolic security, which a, you know, a sidearm would, would make in a situation like this. And, and I guy said, no, it's not me. <laughs> and he was like, no, it's not me. And he said, come on, I mean, cut it off, he said. I mean, this is you. So what's the story? How, how has it ended? What's, what's the resolve part? I said, no, cut it off. I'm in marketing, you know. <laughs> and uh, I put some, 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 some uh, last couple of banknotes I had in, a, in my pocket, Ukrainian uh, currency. It was uh, um, almost at the place where my, my ex-girlfriend lived and uh, so I had to, to put some money on my you know, Ukrainian mobile operator so it would still be functioning so I could give some calls uh, when I crossed the border. I took a blah blah car and I, I went through Krakow, Poland to Prague and later I took another blah blah and I arrived in Hamburg. It was uh, it was middle December. Uh, I was I had two bags in my in my hands, one the, the rucksack and the other it was a, a small traveler's bag. So I had a pair of moccasins, I had an extra pair of Levi's jeans, I had a one um, shirt from my so-called Brussels wardrobe, I called it, and from the times when I was uh, 
um, a, a special correspondent in NATO headquarters. So I had this white color thing with me to do, to do some you know business meetings or whatever political talks, and I that was a book. And that was the bunch of digital evidence from the criminal case. That were the tablets, the smartphones, and the personal computers of two out of three people killed in the first sequence of events that opened my own portal to the gray zone. So basically, re investigating smuggling, I myself turned into a smuggler smuggling the digital evidence in the criminal case. But this criminal evi this digital evidence was not stolen by me from the, the, um, the criminal, uh, from, the, from the crime scene. It was basically restored by my group after it was destroyed by those people who were supposed to do the investigation. So we were able to partially restore the texting and the, uh, the stockpiles of documents and pictures collected by the investigators so that we could partially restore the digital evidence in a series of crimes that was much I, broader than the series of murders. So you said when you left the Ukraine, you did not fathom the period of time it, you would have to stay outside, but you were sure that eventually you would go back. Four and a half years later, you're living in Germany in exile. Yes. Has this fact changed your feeling towards your home country? Are you bitter? Are you... The fight is not over. The fight is, is still there. It's just that the pile of shit of the war crimes and the, and the crimes and the corruption is not getting any smaller. It's just getting bigger. And uh, what we try to do by we, I mean just this very small, this very tiny investigative group, including one exiled police officer living in Northern Europe who was the, also the supplier of information, but not, he was not supplying me with the stuff. He was supplying Andre. This guy has fled months before the first murder. This guy, another couple of uh, investigators and journalists and, and cameramen, uh, and the digital experts were still trying to, to, uh, to dig into this case. For me, my mission was to finish the book that I could um, tell the story uh, from A to Z at least by the moment where I could still um, trace the, the threads that I was able to, to get out of that. Think, when you think about Kiev or Ukraine, what do you miss most? My hunting grounds, I'm a hunter. I miss my people. I miss some absolutely personal things that belong to the field where uh, I become weak, therefore I would not expose it. I miss the place where I was planning to be happy. That place is called home. Are there moments when you regret that when you were warned off, you stubbornly continued to investigate with all the results which followed? No, that was no, that was no choice. I mean, it was a one-way ticket from the start. When the guy was killed, uh, he left me with a bunch of information he shared with me. Most of that, the part of that, essential part of that, was recorded. So, I, uh, as a professional, I just could not, I skip this stuff. So I had to do something with it. Uh, every once in a while, I wake up 
in a world before September the 2nd, 2015, where I would not go to this directly, to this, to this, to this uh, trip, where I would not raise my head and say, yeah, I will investigate the smuggling and uh, the money laundering in the war zone. So, if I could only unring the bell of the middle August, where I said yes to go to the front line to do the investigation I started doing, I would do anything I could to go back to this point. But from the moment on, I received the text message that my most prominent, gifted, uh, and I absolutely clean professional who became my source and trusted me to share his information and allowed me to get into that loophole, into that rabbit hole, I could never, ever stop doing what I did. Sounds strange, my next question, but you have told me that you love Moby Dick, Herman Melville. Why is that so? I was lying low uh, first in Odessa uh, after I got fired and I still got the, the, the calls with the threats. I still got the attorney of the brigade, the former uh, uh, reconnaissance officer of the same military unit who was openly calling for my extermination saying that he would not spare a bullet on me, but calling for the others to do the job. And uh, this type of stuff, I was receiving the silent phone calls, I was, I was having the, um, the reconnaissance car in front of my windows that were spotting my location. And uh, with all the pressure I was having back there, I fled the city. And I was lying low, writing letters, and I was listening to a beautiful project uh, that was called the Moby Dick, The Big Read. Absolutely astonishing thing. The first chapter of Moby Dick read by Tilda Swinton. And uh, I recall the sensation of Moby Dick from the audiobook that, um, uh, that was combined with the sound of waves in Odessa and the, the, the sound of, uh, of a storm. Uh, that was, uh, that was uh, happening on the horizon. And uh, it felt like I gotta grab the book again. And the moment when I read it, I realized that the line where Starbuck says to the crew that there would be no man in my boat who is not afraid of the whale. End of quote. That would have to be in my book to give the reader the sensation of what it is like to go after the monster that is bigger than yourself. So, how do you feel then about Captain Ahab? A man who has lost his leg because uh, he had an encounter with a whale and who follows this creature who thinks he has to kill him. How do you feel about Ahab? He's doomed. He's obsessed by the, by the desire of revenge. And I'm not. That's the biggest difference between us. I don't seek revenge. I just know how it feels like to be in the open sea with a monster underneath you that could be your fate and that is the fate in case of Ahab. So it's, it's, it's a comfort to read about something that you already know and to meet someone whom you already know far better than he knows himself. And this is my relationship to Ahab. Uh, he is the guy that was there and he did the same job that I did trying to catch the monster that is stronger than yourself. Alexei, Alexei Bobrovnikov, who is your own Moby Dick? 
who are you chasing? Is there anyone you, the Captain Ahab of the world, is hunting? The place where Ahab meets the whale is this gray zone, is this zone where the last empire on the European map is biting its own tail, destroying its own parts for some crazy method of regaining the powers and influence. It has to destroy its own part. And this is where the most um, threatening situation for the whole European continent is happening. This is the war uh, that is waged upon the, the smaller remnants of the Soviet colossus that fell. And so this moment when Ahab met the whale, Ahab was killed. For me, as, a, as the guy who's doing documentaries and writing books, this is the moment of exposure when I have to have my camera ready to take a picture of the whale and show it to my fellow Europeans and say, look, this is the monster I've been following, not to take revenge, but to make you aware that we still face this threat. And this is not my crazy act of revenge or an attempt to be romantic. No, this is the real threat for our mutual security. Because when my source was killed and when I was threatened by the group of individuals being a part of this KGB system, as we called it decades ago, but being the descendants of the same monster of the Soviet special forces, security forces, we still face the same security issue that years and years before. Thank you, Alexei, for having been here shared your, your experience, your story. We wish you all the best, we wish you luck, and we will meet again in another occasion. Fight goes on. <laughs>